Khalid Ibn Walid was a 7th century Arab who lived in the end of the 6th century but most of his life was in the 7th century and in this talk I'm going to start by making a completely subjective statement that I'm going to draw a bunch of ire and probably get a stream of nasty comments. Pale Abnormal Elite was one of the three greatest warriors of all time and he totally embodied warfare so this is a talk about war and I'll probably also get a little bit of flack for over glorifying war. I want to attack the way history is taught in the United States because the way we structure Western civilization courses is based on two really big flaws, proximity bias and a proximity bias toward the last 350 years. The British defeat in Afghanistan in the 19th century was closer to you but had a much smaller impact than the Battle of Actium 2000 years ago. Western civilization was not a color-based endeavor and if anything it was founded by brown people so the attempt to capture something that they didn't create and make it theirs and then divorce it from its creators is a profoundly racist bias. The class admits that Western civilization was created by Iraqis and Egyptians, but then pretends that Western civilization got up and ran away and began inhabiting Italy, Germany, and England and never again ended up in the Middle East. We act as if the medieval period only took place in Europe, we rename the birthplace of Western civilization the Middle East, and we ignore everything that was happening in the Middle East during the medieval period. While Europeans had no indoor plumbing and no paved roads and their life expectancy was 40, the Middle East had indoor plumbing that brought fresh water in and took sewage water out, and the Middle East had streets that were lit up at night with oil lamps. The battle took place because a guy named Gaius Julius Kaiser decided to start an illegal war with the Celts living in Gaul to conquer them and plunder their resources and enslave them. He becomes fabulously wealthy and saves his family from bankruptcy. He was part of a secret illegal arrangement with two other men, and they controlled the Senate and basically ruled Rome and everybody would pretend somebody else was doing it. Crassus saw how wealthy Caesar became and wanted to conquer Persia. He took 40,000 Romans and marched from Syria into the Persian Empire and met at Karhi with 32,000 infantry and 4,000 light cavalry and about 4,000 medium cavalry. The Romans met the Persians that cut hay and they fired arrows at them, but the arrows bounced harmlessly off the shields and so the Romans kept marching forward and then the Persians turned around and fired another round at the Romans. The Romans go out of Testudo and lower their shields to chase the 8,000 Persian horse archers, who turn around in their saddles and fire backwards. The Romans are shocked by the Persians' heavy cavalry, they don't have time to pull up Testudo and hundreds of Romans go down, this rattles the Romans and they start running, but they see 1,000 cataphracts on top of armored horses. 1,000 Qatar frauds was far superior to 8,000 Roman cavalry because they were tanks and there was almost nothing you could do to them. The Romans were trying to stop the frauds, but they couldn't really hear them. The Romans are forced to run towards these cavalry units and they can't get into formation so the cataphracts cut through them like a hot knife through butter. The Romans are dying everywhere and Crassus comes up with a new strategy. They'll just fight this until the Persians run out of arrows. When you're trying to get the other side to run out of ammo, it's always a bad day, but when the Persians bring 1,000 camels loaded with 1,000 arrows each, it's even worse. On the second day about 10,000 Romans escaped, about 10,000 Romans were captured including Crassus, and 20,000 Romans were killed and about 200 Persians died when you outnumber the enemy 5 to 1 and they kill you at a ratio of 100 to 1 that's a bad day. The Persian surgeons kept Crassus alive so that Auroras could have a nice conversation with him, but the Persian emperor brought Crassus into his tent and poured molten gold down his throat. The Romans managed to keep a border between the Persians and themselves for most of that time period, but in the 3rd century a Persian emperor named Shapur beat three Roman emperors and captured one Roman emperor with two whole intact Roman legions. Rome gets into really big trouble and Persia gets into really big trouble because of Indonesian fishermen. The Indonesians discovered there were islands through the middle of the Indian Ocean and they could island hop their whole way towards Africa and they set up a colony on Madagascar and began growing rice and trading it with Africa and before long Africa itself began to grow rice. 
The reason why this is a problem is because to grow rice you flood a field and when you flood a field you create a place for mosquitoes to grow and malaria ends up tearing up the entire region from Spain to Iran populations the life expectancies absolutely plunge and then there's an outbreak of the bubonic plague. We want to play goes back to sleep for those of you doing the math real quick it's six and a half centuries we got a century and a half left. By the 6th century AD, the Roman Empire and the Persian Empire are dramatically reduced, and the Romans are barely surviving. Rome did not fall in 476 AD, it reunified in 1453 AD, and the capital was Constantinople. A Roman general named Phocas killed the Roman Emperor and made himself the Roman Emperor, but the Persian emperor was outraged and declared war on Rome to avenge the death of his friend Morichios. The Persian emperor had some successes, but the war dragged on and eventually a new Roman emperor was installed. The problem is that this war now has a life of its own, and even though Phocas is taken out of the picture, the Persian general uh, is just going to fight it out. Shabas carved off a chunk of the Roman empire and began ruling it himself eventually rebelling against the Persians and the Roman Empire made a deal with Shabas to end the war and make Nikitas the new emperor, but Nikitas was stabbed to death 40 days later. In 610 in Arabia a man named Muhammad receives prophecy from the Archangel Gabriel and becomes the prophet who will create Islam in 622 the people of Mecca kick him and his followers out because they hate his religion and they're worried that it might replace their religion. He realizes that he's created a third Abrahamic religion and does the Hydra, which takes him to Athrib, which gets renamed Medina Nebi, which means the city of the prophet. Khalid Ibn Walid was a soldier in both battles in 625 and 627, and he switched sides and converted to Islam within two years. He was marching with soldiers from Yathrib north to Petra. A Muslim army marches towards Muta with the goal of attacking the Roman Empire. The Romans find out about this army and dispatch a force to go meet it. We don't know the exact size of the Roman force, but I would bet that it was about 10,000 soldiers. The Muslim Arabs are deployed against Christian Arabs who are fighting for the Romans, and the Romans outnumber them probably 3 or 4 or 5 to 1. Khalid will take soldiers and give them a banner and have them sneak around a hill at night and then come over the top of the hill in the daytime and sneak another banner. Khalid Ibn Walid tried to keep the Romans from attacking by marching in a circle around a hill and setting five ten campfires in front of them, and then keeping walking around in front of the campfires until he got far enough away from the Roman army to just run. The Prophet Muhammad will eventually capture Mecca and will own the western and eastern parts of Arabia, but not the rest. The Ethiopians had never ruled Arabia, the Romans had never ruled Arabia, and the closest anyone had come to ruling all of Arabia was the Prophet Muhammad, but when he died Abu Bakr became the ruler of this Muslim-controlled chunk of Arabia. Khalid won battle after battle after battle and by 633 Arabia was unified in part because of Khalid's decisive victories in the center of Arabia. There is argument amongst historians exactly what happened next, but Khalid didn't stop. Khalid fights a battle in what is today Kuwait against the Persian general Hormuz who chains up his elite soldiers to show the Arabs that there is no retreat and that the Parians will fight to the death. The Arabs would get their best improv poet to shout poetry at the other army of Paul and if the other army of Paul didn't understand the poetry, the Arabs would send their champion to fight the Persian champion. The Persian general went out to fight but Khalid Willi killed him within 30 seconds and now the Persians are going into the battle without their general. Khalid used his cavalry to harass the Persians and tore them to pieces. He brought 18,000 men against 20,000 Persians and walked away with a couple hundred killed. He's going to work his way along the western bank of the Euphrates River, and fight three more battles, including one he doesn't remember. At one of the battles, one of the Persian generals walked out because Khalid kept going, and the other Persian general bet that bastard would do this again. Khalid buried twelve Persian soldiers in the battlefield, one of Khalid's cousins was in the army there, and they killed all thirteen Persians and Khalid would use different tactics every time, 
like he races his army towards the first Persian unit as fast as he can, cuts his army into three 5,000 man units, and tells them they're going to arrive at 2 a.m., and gives them a date two weeks in advance. I challenge you to go on a long road trip with two of your best friends and use GPS to find a spot somewhere on the other side of the US. Then, time it so that the three armies arrive at the exact same moment and destroy the enemy army. He tells his men to go and wipe out the third 20,000 man unit with almost no losses, and dispatched 60,000 men in a maneuver that a contemporary military force would never be able to execute, let alone three times in a row. For 680 years the Romans and the Persians had been fighting each other, but by the time Khalid got to Firas, the Romans looked at each other and said they had a new enemy, and didn't know where these guys even came from. The Arabs are outnumbered, out-technology, out-moneyed, out-experienced, out-equipped, and Khalid has captured Iraq in one year. The Persians go to the Romans and ask for help against the Arab army but the Romans know that the Arabs are outnumbered, out-technologed, and out-moneyed and yet they attacked both empires at the same time. Khalid arrives at Firas, where the combined Roman and Persian armies were 150,000 men against 15,000 Muslims. Khalid is on the east bank of the Euphrates, the Persians and the Romans are on the west bank, there's a ford and a bridge, so Halit splits his army into three 5,000-man units puts one up river, one down river, and pulls the other one away from the river, and waits. When 50,000 Persians and Romans crossed the Euphrates, the men that were up and down river attacked them. Khalid took 5,000 men and charged into 50,000 Persians and Romans, but the Persians and Romans were so compressed they could not move their arms or swing their weapons, so they panicked and turned around to run back to the river to cross it but the Muslim Arabs killed them all. The Prophet Muhammad put on a hood, did the Hajj, jumped back on a horse, and rode to the front of his army just as it was arriving at Hira and marched his men into the city. Abubak orders him to invade Syria, but he's going to miss Dura and head towards Damascus because the Muslim Arabs are thinking if they capture Damascus they'll get Jerusalem in the aftermath. Khalid takes his men across a really nasty chunk of desert, shows up in Syria, captures Damascus, and then Emperor Heraclius gets together his generals and decides to launch a counterattack, sending four Roman armies to catch the four Muslim Arab armies in four separate locations and take them out piecemeal. Heracles does not want to have all four of his armies together because he doesn't have the economy to support having that many men in one location and he's worried that Khalid's first cousin will try to become the new caliph. The Muslims try to figure out what to do when the Hassanites keep attacking them from behind. They decide to hold a conference and then the commander asks a challenging question. The Roman army is led by an Armenian named Vahan but a huge chunk of it is actually made up of Arabs Christian Arabs so this is going to be an Arab versus Arab fight at some core level. Vahan brings his army up and puts it in between the second ravine in the west and the Muslim army on day one he does a really light gentle probing attack to figure out what he's up against. The Muslim Arabs are outnumbered by about three to one, so Vahan doesn't want to do anything risky on day one. Vachan orders the Roman left flank and right flank to hit the Muslim army as hard as they can, but the weight of the Roman army is so overwhelming that both Muslim flanks are collapsing and they're in full retreat. The women have always been an integral part of warfare, the Persians had an all-woman archer division, and the stories about the Amazons weren't made up, they really did attack a bunch of Greek city-states on the Aegean Sea. I think it's cool that women were fielded in ancient battles, but they were usually support staff. The Romans were against it but the Arabs had some women warriors. The women on Amar Ibn al-Assad's side pull down the tents, grab the posts and charge the men who are retreating, shouting at them to either be killed by their wives or be killed by the Romans. The next day, Von Bahan decides to focus everything he's got on the Muslim right flank, and breaks them the next day. 
Day 4 Khaled pushes the same Muslim right flank just hit him as hard as you can with everything you've got and he manages to stabilize the flank even though it does start to collapse they do start to fall back and they manage to push the Romans back and they stop day 4 right where they started. The Muslims have captured the bridge over the western ravine and are trying to get the Romans to run towards it. Khaled took 40,000 men against 120,000 men at Yarmouth and destroyed them. Then he took his cavalry and slammed it into the back of the Roman army, and then he chased down General Vahan and killed him, and then he went and recaptured Damascus. Emperor Heraclius asks his remaining generals what should we do about Syria and they tell him we've lost it, so he gets on a ship and says farewell Syria, you have been a lovely province, and he withdraws. Khalid and his army returned to Jerusalem but the Romans had abandoned it and there were still people manning the walls so they were stuck outside trying to get inside. A Christian Arab and a loyal Roman citizen indicate they're willing to negotiate with Omar Abner the Caliph, but the phoenix finds out the Caliph is actually Khalid ibn Walid and calls off the negotiations for the surrender. Sophronius sees the caliph's army arrive and as he approaches he sees a man leading a camel with a man on the camel and he recognizes the man as Sophronius, the cardinal who is wearing red robes and gold jewelry. The guy leading the camel says he's the chalice and the guy leading the camera says he's the caliph and the guy leading the camera says he's not trying to plunder anything I'm a humble man with humble needs I just need good meal. At this point Sephoras is like oh what who just conquered us what are these Marxists and so Sophonius gets off the lectica and says okay I want to talk to you about our surrendering the city to you and the caliph says okay let's walk to the city and discuss it. When Romans capture a city they enslave a segment of the population, plunder the city, and burn some of it, but the caliph refuses to do any of that and instead wants to eject the Roman politicians with whatever they can carry. They walk into the city and Khalid is one of the men following them. Sophronius asks him about his religion and um starts telling about Islam, and Sophonius goes it just sounds like a variation of Christianity. The team thought they were doing Judaism 3.0, but were received as being so different. The alarm is going on, and the team can't turn it off. The first place that the first Muslim god of prayed in Jerusalem was going to become a mosque. So the archbishop and the caliph went and found an empty lot and prayed there side by side. Today, that spot is a mosque. The caliph wants to see the temple mount, but the sophomores say they haven't been treating it as a holy day, so they turned it into a garbage jump to punish the Jews. The caliph can't believe what he's looking at and falls on his knees to clear the garbage off the temple mount. The caliph went to meet some Jews in Jerusalem and was told that there were no Jews in Jerusalem because the Christians had murdered 20,000 Jews in Jerusalem and had purged the city of its remaining Jewish population. A Jewish convert to Islam was asked to find 80 Jewish families to move to Jerusalem. Omar turned to Khalid and said he hated him and was retiring him. Khalid never fought another battle and died in bed at age 50. He didn't know what was ailing him. But his final words were, you cannot put a hand anywhere on my body without touching a combat wound.